Hi, I'm Jack Hanlon. This short video gives a quick review of complex numbers. If you understand complex numbers, you might still want to browse because there's a surprise at the end. If you only have a vague notion of what complex numbers are, but you haven't used them since high school, then this review might help you understand my talk at the 2019 Energy Science and Technology Conference in July. Now we all know about arithmetic for real numbers. We know how to add them, subtract them, multiply and divide them because we use those skills often in our daily lives. And we can even take the square root of any positive number. Sometimes we know it, but if we don't, we can always use a calculator. That is the easy way these days. When we got to high school, we studied algebra and solved equations for the unknown x. Now I'm going to use z instead of x because I want to save x for something else later in the talk. But it doesn't matter. z or x is just the unknown in the equation we want to solve. The simplest algebraic equations are linear equations. And they are real easy to solve. They can be reduced using the rules of arithmetic to form just like this special case, 3z minus 3 equal to 0 which only has one solution, c equal to 1. Now you can't get much simpler than that. Even though linear equations are simple to solve, we can illustrate something really important with them. Replace the 0 on the right hand side of the equation with y. So that when y equal to 0, we get the original equation. But now we can make a table of the solution z for different values y. And we can plot y versus z on a graph. The solutions fall in a straight line. That's important because we get a picture to go with the equation and the picture gives a better understanding of linear equations. If we change the coefficients in the original equation and do the same thing again, we get different straight lines and a whole host of questions pop up. How do the coefficients change the picture of the line? Where do different lines intersect? And so forth. I think this is the important thing. Just by playing around and asking what if we did this or that to the original equation and showing the results in a picture, we get a much richer view of the simple algebraic equation than if we just did the algebra alone. I think this is very much the way Richard Feynman talked about learning. By imagining if you were the first to see this equation and asking yourself what you would do and comparing that to what actually happened. Now let's up the game a little bit. Let's try to solve a quadratic equation. And generally, in general, these equations have a z squared term, a z term, and a constant. The coefficients a, b, and c are just placeholders for real numbers. In general, these equations have two solutions given by the quadratic formula. If you remember anything about high school algebra, this might be it. The history of the quadratic formula and the quadratic equation and the solution goes way back. Pythagoras and Euclid knew how to solve quadratic equations about 450 BC. They did it in a different way of course, but they knew how to get the answers. The modern notation didn't come about until it was published by René Descartes in 1637. He was the guy who also been, invented the rules for multiplying signed numbers. You rem may remember them. A plus number times a plus number gives a plus number. A minus number times a minus number gives a plus number. And a minus number times a plus number gives a minus number. Here's a modern derivation of the quadratic formula just so you don't think it was pulled out of thin air. You don't need to know how to derive it, but you can follow the steps if you're interested. 
Here's an example showing how to solve a quadratic equation using the quadratic formula. The quadratic equation we want to solve is on the top left. The, equation, the general form of the equation is below that. And when we compare these two, we can pick off the coefficients a, b, and c, which in this case are a is equal to 1, b is equal to 5, c is equal to 9 fourths. We plug these numbers, a, b, and c, into the quadratic formula, and the rest is just arithmetic. We get the solution z1 and z2 down at the bottom of the page. z1 is equal to minus 1 half, and z2 is equal to minus 9 halves. We can check our arithmetic, and we just plug the solution back into the original equation, and we should get 0 equal to 0 if we did everything right. Now let's do the same trick we did before. Replace the 0 by y on the right side of the equation. Make a table of the different choices of y and the solutions that they create, z1 and z2, and plot them on a graph. When we connect the points in an obvious way, they fall in a curve called a parabola. Pretty neat. All but just imagining what would happen if we did something simple and checking it out. Now if we change the coefficients in the original equation and do the same thing again, we get different looking curves and the same kind of new questions pop up. Which coefficients change the shape of the parabola and how? And where did the parabolas intersect and so forth? It's fun to look at problems this way, and combining the picture and the equation really helps. It leads to new ways to think about things. It's kind of like you're an explorer. This approach doesn't work for everybody. Some people just want the prescription for solving the algebraic equation. Different strokes for different folks, I guess. But I think it's fun to imagine what happens when you do this or that thing to the equation, just like you were the first one to see it, and you're the explorer. Sometimes you try to solve the quadratic equation using the quadratic formula and it doesn't seem to work. Here's an example. In the top equation, we have a is equal to 1, b is equal to 3, and c is equal to 25 over 4. If we plug these into the quadratic formula, we see immediately what the problem is. You can't take the square root of a minus number. In this case, the square root of minus 16. Now, if you don't know anything about complex numbers, you don't know what to do. Early on, people didn't know what to do either. So what did they do? They just said, oh, the heck with it. They changed the minus sign to a plus sign and went on with their lives. But Leonhard Euler, a famous mathematician in the 1700s, said, wait a minute, let's fool around a little bit. He said, let's let the minus 1 equal i squared and substitute that into the quadratic formula inside the square root sign. Then he could take the square root and get the solutions, z1 and z2, shown below, and complex numbers were born. They're sometimes called imaginary numbers, but that's a bad name, I think, because there's nothing imaginary about them. I think this is interesting. If the solutions are real, they're both real, and if the solutions are complex, they're both complex. That's because of the plus and minus sign in front of the square root. The complex solutions always come out in pairs, called complex conjugate pairs. For this reason, you never get one complex solution and one so real solution to a quadratic equation. If you go to the next step, cubic equations, there are three solutions. The three solutions come in two forms. You can get three real solutions, or you can get two complex conjugate solutions 
combined with one real solution. But here's an important question. How do you plot complex numbers? The picture view has almost disappeared from the algebra. Today, the general complex number is usually written as z is equal to x plus iy, where x and y are positive or negative real numbers, just like in the cases we've solved before. For the last 300 years or so, people have been learning how to do the arithmetic, that's add them, subtract them, multiply and divide them, and do the algebra and calculus of complex numbers. But the connection to a picture, or a geometric connection, was put into the background. It's turned out that complex numbers are really useful in many applications in engineering and physics, especially in electrical engineering. Carl Steinmetz, who some say is the father of modern electrical engineering, used them to solve AC circuit problems starting in the 1890s. Now some say that Tesla should be called the father of EE, but he didn't communicate this way and the Steinmetz method is the method still taught today to all electrical engineers. A modern com view of complex numbers has developed over the last 50 years or so. It's called geometric algebra. With this new way of looking at things, the connection between algebra and a picture and geometry is restored. David Heston is the inventor of this new approach puts it this way, geometry without algebra is dumb, algebra without geometry is blind. What is, the most, what is most important is that in this new way of doing things, some new terms show up in expression for work and power. It turns out that in this new way of looking at things, work and power are complex numbers. And that hasn't been the case in the past because work and power are typically considered by physicists and mechanical engineers to be just real numbers. You know what that means. There are new opportunities to explain things that we might not have been able to explain before. Electrical engineers know that power is a complex number because in AC circuits they write power as a complex number S is equal to P plus IQ and show it in a power triangle. They call S the apparent power, P the real power, and Q the reactive power. But most mechanical engineers and physicists are unaware of reactive power. They don't even use the concept at all. So why is that important? Well, because the mechanical conservation principles were developed to apply to the real part P of this equation. That was all established well before geometric algebra. But now with geometric algebra, how do conservation of principles apply to the reactive Q part of this equation? Especially for mechanical and electromechanical systems. That's what's new. And there are now new things to examine. Here's what geometric algebra brings to the table. It opens a crack in the armor that the physics community has built around this whole topic of self-running machines. It's how we can explain the missing input for switch reluctance generators in a new way that is satisfactory to the wider scientific community. I think that's important because without this piece, the traditional scientific community is able to write us off as a hoax and shut down the widespread development of these wonderful self-running switched reluctance generators. Well, that's the promised review of complex numbers. Thanks for viewing. Hope to see you at the Energy Science and Technology Conference in July.